very excited to introduce you to a friend of mine and co-conspirator. I don't know what the conspiracy is, but it's good. Uh, he's a co-founder of Judicata, a legal software company, and he is the co-author with Peter Thiel of Zero to One, and he's here to talk to us about the book, Blake Masters. Thanks, Mike, for that. So first thing, I just had a kid, so I'm not getting a lot of sleep, so if I'm sort of word salading all over the place, bear with me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Danielle sad he's not here today, but next summit he will be here, uh, I promise. Youngest so, summiter. youngest summiter ever. Um, I wanted to say just a few words about that orange booklet that many of you have. Uh, so Peter and I have written a book, it's called Zero to One. Um, we're really excited about it. It's, it's, it's based on the notes I took um, at a course he taught at Stanford, and it comes out in, in three months. Um, so we're really, we're really juiced for it, but we're, we're mainly excited to share it with you today and to invite you to get an early copy. Uh, so you'll find instructions for how to do that on the back cover. Um, but I want to thank you for giving me the chance to speak with you today. It's always really fun for me to come to these TF events. And every time I leave one, uh, I can't help but just feel happy. I mean, it's so cool to, to just go home and like reflect on all these conversations I have with all these uh, smart people, mostly young people who are doing really cool, often crazy things. And because everyone in this room uh, is really into technology, you really can't help but leave just kind of feeling really uh, jazzed about like the state of tech in general. That makes sense, because it's San Francisco, it's uh, northern tip of, of Silicon Valley, the technology capital of the world, so it seems like a really fitting feeling. And yet, take a moment to be astonished at how decidedly low tech your surroundings really are. So internet speeds, not just in this building, but regionally and sort of nationally, crawl relative to what they should be. Um, it seems like, I'm a, I'm a new San Franciscan, but it seems like half the city is actually under this terrible traffic causing construction. And it's not like we're building new houses, because that's not allowed. We're building like trivial modifications to existing houses so that rent prices can continue to skyrocket. Um, what else? The, the roads are kind of second world at best. You know, coming from Palo Alto, I've been sort of shocked. Uh, thank goodness for Ubers and Lyfts and, and that whole suite of services. But what do we offer the people who can't afford to take those every day? the slowest public transit system in the nation. So uh, then again, no one thinks that San Francisco like works that well, and maybe that's part of its charm. So if we, if we, if we look nationally, uh, what's going on there, my friend Balaji uh, says that the USA is becoming the Microsoft of nations. And when you, when you stop to consider whether that might be true, consider also two points. So last week, I think Finland and uh, Estonia became the first country to sign a treaty cryptographically. Pretty cool. What do we got here? Turns out you can't even get a PIN number from the irs.gov website outside normal business hours. Like the website actually just shuts down. <laughs> um, so, so the liber libertarian impulse, and that's, that's one that I share, it's probably one that a lot of you share too, is to just blame the government. Uh, if you could get the state out of the way and let the market operate unfettered, the logic goes, maybe you get all these Randy and super entrepreneurs, these prime movers who could single-handedly solve you know, some of our most pressing problems. Kind of like an invisible hand gets a reared in steel in every industry argument. Well, I'm sympathetic to it, but is it right? I sort of don't think it is. It's not how it works at all. Um, I think if we're honest with ourselves, the lack of progress in technology betrays a lack of imagination in the tech sector as much as anything else. And so even if entrepreneurs aren't to blame, even if we're not uh, causing the problems, it's, it's certainly true that we're the only ones that can fix them. And so that statement probably sounds hubristic, and maybe it is. So in the book, Peter and I argue, maybe we need some, some hubris in tech. Always you know, tethered to good cheer, it's important to, to sort of be realistic and, and, and be self-critical, but maybe we do need a lot more hubris in tech to solve big problems given the, the massive scale of the challenges ahead. So that's the kind of spirit that like the valley wags of the world will seize on and try to ridicule. But probably nine times out of 10, the, thing, the right answer is not to listen to them. You know, most critics of Silicon Valley are usually wrong. Often they're transparently driven by resentment, but, uh, but they do make one good argument. And, and I think they're valuable in pointing out uh, this worrying trend 
in valley culture towards short-term thinking, the kind of short-term thinking that pulls really talented entrepreneurs away from big projects and steers them instead towards things that sort of are, are at best going to be incremental advancements. And I, I think that's, that's worth resisting. Because um, look, we can't afford to be incremental. Certainly not as a society, there's a lot more to do. We still have to cure cancer. I understand Thomas Hunt, Teal Fellow, class of 2014, is on it, but he could use some help. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot to be, to be done there. We still have all sorts of other diseases. We have to figure out energy solutions to free the planet from conflict over fossil fuels. You know, we could probably invent new and better ways of getting from point A to point B on the surface of this planet, or we could certainly support Elon and join him in his quest to escape terrestrial confines entirely and colonize new worlds. There's, there's a lot to be done. And you know, it's also true that you can't afford to be incremental in your own life. So Peter's line on this is, you are not a lottery ticket. And it's absolutely true. Your life doesn't have to be something that just like happens to you. You absolutely can chart a course for what you want to do and actually get it done. And uh, that's why we wrote the book, to try to catalyze and reinvigorate a lost spirit of planning and action. Um, and uh, the people who are going to get that done are, are you. I mean, we wrote the book for everybody. The official line is, right, I want you reading the book, whether you uh, are walking through an airport in Kansas or whether you live in Kuala Lumpur, but, but the truth is we wrote the book for you, the people sitting in this room, because you're the ones who aren't afraid to be different. You're the ones who uh, are down to pursue uh, something weird but something important with single-minded obsession, and uh, you're the ones who, who can marry a, a um, you know, a, a courage to, to be wrong along with a fanatical desire to be right. I think that's really special, uh, and we're excited to be a part of it. So, so we hope you get an early copy of the book. Um, I think we have like 75 here. So if you get your devices ready, pull up Amazon, pre-order it. You can actually leave with a copy today. But uh, awesome, awesome. Uh, I hope you read it. I hope you tweet about it. hope you let me know what you think. But mainly, we hope that you have some frank conversations with yourself and with uh, everyone around you about the importance of continuing to do awesome things and to be bold and uh, to never settle. Because the truth is, if we want a better future, uh, it's not going to happen automatically. We've got to make it happen, and we've got to start now. Thanks.